Hi, Adobe Education community, and welcome back to Adobe for Education social media channels. Um, it's great to be here with all of you today. And if you're just joining in from our Facebook groups or from Adobe for Education Twitter or YouTube, please post in the chat where you're joining us from. Again, we have a very special edition for you today. Um, so today I'm joined by a variety of Adobe Education leaders who, as you might know, are our board of advisors here at Adobe. So we currently have 450 Adobe education leaders worldwide that are experts in Creative Cloud and work with us to help um, pave the product roadmap and provide insights and feedback into their expertise um, at their institutions all around the world. And so today you'll be hearing for them um, in a very special Adobe for Education live creative leadership panel. And we'll discuss how creativity has helped us to carve out our per personal brand and garner more visibility for our work as educators. And so make sure to register for more inspiring on-demand talks through the Adobe for Education Summit. We'll be able to post that link below. Um, as you just know, we just wrapped up our summit and you can still access it all the way until August 7th. And then we'll be posting all of that content on our Adobe for Education YouTube channel, which many of you might be tuning in from. So again, I'm going to the comments here. If you are live, I see some folks joining in live. This is a live uh, panel with Adobe Education Leaders. Please post in the chat, whether it's from YouTube, Facebook, or any of our, uh, our Twitter channel, where you're joining us from and what you're excited um, to hear about. We will be taking some live Q&A um, from the comments on social media channels and look forward to hearing from our Adobe Education Leaders. Um, but today, our guests will reflect especially on leadership and education. So please join me in welcoming our very first guest, um, Susan Mango Curtis. And um, Susan Mango is a professor at the School of Journalism, Media, and Integrated Marketing Communications at Northwestern University. As Susan has said, part of leading through the creative process is being able to research and reflect on the topic. She will be sharing how taking a creative approach to storytelling and embracing creativity through the story can lead to bridge tough topics. So I'm really excited to bring on our very first panelist. Please join me in welcoming Susan Mango Curtis, and I will bring her onto the screen now. Hi, Susan. How are you doing today? Fine. Thank you. Great. Well, I will hand it off to you. And again, if you're just um, joining in on our social media channels, please post any comments or questions from our panelists. We are excited to hear from you. So Susan, I'll have you take it away. Thank you, Claire. Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is going to be simple. I'll get to the point. So staying ahead of the curve means having uh, a lifetime of learning. And learning creatively is always fun. So this is something that I've done for a long time with my students in my class. Um, as a designer, I work at Medill School of Journalism in uh, Northwestern University. The students there um, are mostly journalists. And so therefore I don't really have any artists, but there are artists amongst journalists. As we know, journalists like creativity and this was a simple way to do it. So one of the questions that was asked to me was, what would I like to share with you guys that I wish someone had told me when I entered the world of teaching visual journalism back in 1997, was 97? Yeah, 97, I started at Northwestern University. And from, you can see on this slide here, this is from my students. I think the technology is the big thing. You want to be able to uh, overcome, focus on one software at a time that goes for yourself as well as for your students. Now, your students perform a lot better if you're not giving them like six or seven different softwares to go through. I've been guilty of that myself and I had to learn over years that that wasn't the right way to go. Now, each day schedule 30 minutes of your own time to learn something new. This is gonna enhance your ability to be the best possible leader. 
That means it could be a learning illustrator or Photoshop, or um, it could be XD. I do a little bit of everything every day. So 30 minutes of one of those applications plus learning something else. So it's an hour altogether. So I'm learning some other things that I'm going to read about. You need to wrap up your uh, lesson plans around one application at a time. And this will keep the confusion down with your students. That's going to help it a whole lot. So I've shared some things in my queue, and I've also put this up in uh, the share for you guys. But uh, this is my Adobe Spark page. And here's some things for some of my students. So we use Adobe Spark in my grad courses as well as in my undergrad courses. We reach really tough topics. Like this one was on um, abuse, false uh, care, and helping students deal with this. We were working with a class in London at the time. A friend of mine was working there, and she was giving some topics that she deals with with children there. So one of my uh, ideas was to bring students together in collaboration. And so two students actually collaborated on this particular project here. And so once you click on these, I don't have a whole lot of time, it's like seven minutes. So you can click on any of these and look at them. There's also um, a photo essay in the beginning. This is a print project. This one here is a photo essay. And then this one down here was a food truck challenge. This came from Adobe. Actually, another uh, Adobe leader was working on such a thing. And I looked at it and I said, how can I adapt this? to higher education and looking at hard topics and making students think about them like the foster care one, this one made it a little bit easier. This was more looking at my integrated marketing students and my journalism students coming together to create a project. So you've got two of those there. I also teach undergrad students and to create the environment of stress-free learning, you wanna make sure those students feel that their creativity comes first, small cap, um, you put them in small uh, collaborative teams, this makes it much easier and goes around all the conflict and all the problems that might show up, especially if you're working in Zoom. And of course, we've all been working in Zoom and other applications online. So less uh, competition amongst student projects. So I don't have the students compete with each other. I have each group actually critique each other's group and give feedback and give each other help. I consider this a, a activity called one-on-one. -on -one. one helps one. So one group helps the other group. So then there's no competition to say my work is better than yours. It's all of us win at the end. Less focus on software and more emphasis on critical thinking. So this always helps the students a lot. We start with paper and we end in digital. And so here's some other uh, tough topics. We looked at hate in America, which was something a lot of people in the class were dealing with. And we know this is a tough topic. I don't uh, uh, shy away from this with my undergrads. And actually, they're probably some of the best people to actually go after to do such a thing. So we have quite a few of these here. I've given you two pages. And these are done and projects with two people in mind. They come up with the concept themselves, they research it, and then they deliver it as a visual presentation. So this is what you call visual storytelling on steroids, where you have to have a visual, you have to have a strong headline, you have to have a summary statement, and then you break it up into pieces so people can digest it. So I've given you a couple of them here to look at. Uh, leadership ideas for you, leadership resources. I use 99U. Uh, conference as well as their website. You'll find some really spectacular information here on looking at strategies for embracing um, uh, contradictions and uh, uh, disagreements when you with your colleagues or even with your students. Uh, there's another one here looking at defining the quality of leadership. I found that one to be excellent. You want to look at that and I've given you links to both of them right here. Now, and I wanted to also go over Educate, educators communities. One of the biggest ones that I visit on a regular basis is the Adobe Ed Education Exchange, where you will find plenty of uh, opportunities to learn, to share, and to get involved. Uh, I've given you a link to that. It's, it's probably a resource that um, I, I would say over the years, it has become probably one of the number one uh, resources for faculty and um, I've suggested it to many of the, my members of the faculty at Northwestern. Um, there's also AIGA community. AIGA is um, 
professional organization of graphic designers. And they have a workshop that's going on right now, as you can see on this page right here, it's August uh, 2nd through the 6th. And there's also provides resources for you in writing uh, a syllabus uh, curriculum, um, having dialogue and building those relationships. As an instructor myself, I have found learning, uh, learning and being able to become the best possible leader in my field. It started way before I became an educator and I was in a newsroom. I joined the National Association of Black Journalists. Uh, I've also joined Society for News Design, AIGA, and also being a part of the Adobe Educational Leaders. All of these organizations give you the ability to have networking, mentoring, and people that actually will speak in uh, answer questions that you might have on any topic. So if you have any questions for me, like I said, there's a link in the uh, folder I have to get out because I know there's other people that are waiting to come in. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Susan, for sharing this with us and uh, for sharing your email address. So I know there's a couple um, folks that have just joined in live. So if you have any questions um, for Susan, please send her an email um, at Northwestern University. But thank you again, Mingo, so much for joining us today and sharing this. And I just posted in the chat um, the Spark page so everyone has access to it. All right, perfect. Thank you, Claire. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, again, if you're just uh, joining in, um, you know, please post in the chat uh, where you're joining us from, if you have any questions for our panelists. But this is a very special end of year event for our Adobe Education Leaders, who are, are our board of advisors here at Adobe for Education. And you'll be hearing from a few other members of our community as they share their insights um, for creative leadership. So I'm thrilled to bring on our next uh, panelist, um, who is Diane Ehrlich. Uh, Diane is faculty for the School of Design at George Brown College um, in Toronto, in o Ontario, in Canada. And Diane will inspire you to remember something that we often forget, uh, that you native capable, and yes, you are good enough to lead others. So Diane, I will bring you on to the stream now. Nice Hi. to see you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Great. Well, I'll just hand it off to you. And if there's any okay. um, questions, I will uh, moderate the chat. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Diane Ehrlich. And as stated, I live in Toronto, Canada and teach at George Brown College School of Design. Um, I don't have a slide deck <laughs> because it was hard getting this together for me. I'm actually quite nervous about this, so I just thought I'll put that out there. Um, but I am an ed Adobe Education Leader, partnered by design. Uh, I also managed to get my AC1 and the ACP in visual design. Now, you would think that makes me feel like I'm good enough. It does not. <laughs> and I think we all suffer from the imposter syndrome. So how did I get here is the question. Um, when you're when you're so involved in yourself that you feel like everything you do is not good enough, how do you move forward? How do you make it good enough? How do you how do you make yourself uh, work in this realm, okay, or in any realm uh, when you feel that way, okay? Um, unlike many of uh, the people I work with in education, um, past high school, I only took night school. So um, I didn't go to college in the day school system or uni. Um, I don't have a BA or an MA, et cetera. Uh, but I do hold many certifications <laughs> in what I do. Uh, as a matter of fact, and some in what I don't do, but that's a whole other story. As a matter of fact, at one time, I had as many as 65 uh, ongoing accreditation, accreditation. Sorry, excuse me. Um, and uh, that was back in the day, though. Uh, nowadays, I try to keep it more simple. <laughs> um, so let's talk about not feeling adequate or good enough, because when you come from that kind of a background where... Um, you're constantly being told that, oh, don't worry, we'll take care of this because we know you can't do it. Or um, don't worry, um, you'll get it later. That's my personal favorite one. <laughs> uh, so um, I grew up thinking I was mostly not good enough. Uh, this comes from a feel, this predominantly comes from a fear of failure. And I think that happens to a lot of our students as well. Um, for the most part, there were other contributing factors, but fear seems to be the big one, okay? 
Um, but I'll get back to that in a second. Uh, the kids we teach, uh, the ones that are silent, the ones that act out, um, they're kind of opposite coins on the same path. And many come from an arena of not getting it. As a matter of fact, I feel that many of us uh, come from an arena of, I don't get it, <laughs> or I don't understand it, or it doesn't really make any sense to me. Um, I was that kid that didn't get it. Um, but weirdly, it's not that I didn't get it. It's just that I didn't think that I was able to regurgitate or to um, talk about, uh, you know, the things I know. Uh, who the hell's going to listen, you know? Um, so coming also coming from um, I'm I come from a family of four people four passports so everybody's an immigrant I was the only one who was born in Toronto and um, so there was a lot of that that also attributed to the way that my upbringing was so you know things that they that my parents wanted you know be a lawyer be a doctor be <laughs> all of those things was not where I was I wanted to be a photographer. I and then I learned about printing, and then I switched it up for design, and then back into the graphic. You know, back then we called it graphic arts. Now it's graphic design. I had to switch it up twice, uh, and that all happened because of one teacher. Um, and I'll get back to that in a minute as well. Uh, I actually got my first taste of graphic design when I was in high school. Actually, I'll get to that right now. Apparently, uh, we had a pre press, and I was fortunate enough to meet the teacher. Uh, by luck one day and he invited me to help him set the presses up for the next year. Now this was when I was in grade 12 and the next year I was graduating. Um, so grade 13 was still around back then. <laughs> so uh, so I wouldn't be able to take his course. So he let me come in and actually work the machines. Now while I was doing that and in the in-between while I was still trying to figure out who I was, um, you know, who is this creative person who also needs a job? right? <laughs> Some of my jobs were, I was a lifeguard at a golf course. I worked at a radio station for several years, both on air and behind. I was an actor for several years, a uh, manager of a clothing store, call center operator, bookstore clerk. And the last one that changed everything, I was a stock trader. Now you might think, what the hell is a creative person doing being a stock trader? And I was there for six years overall. I was actually there three times. Um, I hated that job so much. And I went back three times. I don't understand it either, but let's move on. <laughs> okay. But the light bulb went off. I decided to take the train where I wanted it to go. All right. It was time for me to move into what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to be a photographer. So I studied and I was a professional photographer for four years. I wanted to write this. I wanted more than anything in the world. And as a matter of fact, that was the dream, right? Um, but Going to school, I learned that I was not really grammatical. Even when I'm talking now, you can probably notice that. Um, so uh, the first chance I got was for a magazine back in the day. It was called Graphic Exchange Magazine. And he needed a piece on, um, he wanted me to write about me going freelance as a graphic designer at that time and how I went about it, how I got my computer, how I got everything going. Um, and this was like, 90 early 90s late 80s okay so um i lost my spot there we are so the interesting thing was i was very nervous about it because i was not trained as a writer i didn't know a lot about how to write properly i speak with run-on sentences there's all sorts of things going on there and so basically what ended up happening was um he said to me don't worry um i know you're not a writer diane but it's fine. I just need to fill space and I can do the editing for you. My dream went to the floor because I thought to myself, well, it doesn't matter. But the thing that changed and why going from stock trading into this, this magazine work uh, was so important for me was because when it got published, he didn't change a comma. He didn't edit a thing. And it showed me that sometimes I think that I'm not good enough because, and no one can really make you feel a thing, but you can feel a thing based on what people say. And this is what I bring into education now, because being that person who for years was told they couldn't do something because no real reason, um, changed it, changed it all. And so at that point, that's when I changed it. So education came as an accident after that. Um, I became an educator because they needed somebody who was a last minute thing. They needed someone to teach Cork Express, um, which changed years later. 
<laughs> and uh, so I went in and changed Quark Express. And the first thing that was told to me uh, was um, uh, the I taught to 32 of the most hostile people you will ever, ever encounter because they had been told their course was canceled. And so I came in to uh, sub for a teacher that they didn't like. And so when I came in, I said, I'm going to pretend that you don't know anything. And I just going to bring it up from the bottom. And I went through the whole thing. And at the last minute, I'm going to keep the swearing out of this because the students swore. Uh, they said, well, hell, I learned more in the last 15 minutes or in the first 15 minutes of this class. And I learned all of last year. And all of a sudden I could hear people breathing. And that's when I knew I could do this. And I was good enough to do this. And that's a big moment for anybody, right? When it comes to what you're doing, I found my people. I found my niche. I found everything that I wanted to do. I wanted to work with people. I wanted to help them grow because I was that kid who didn't feel like they were good enough for anything. Um, so, um, through the years, I noticed that, you know, people actually listen to me, which is a little scary. Uh, <laughs> and I do have a way of getting the knowledge across. It might not be a standard pedagogy, but it's my version of it. Uh, it's not the same, but it, it works. And I treat my students as colleagues in training. Um, I tell them they are creative and no one can say they aren't because, you know, unless they do that job, how the hell would they know? I try to make them fail enough that they understand how to succeed. Um, because one of the biggest things is without failure, we can't move forward. Without people telling me I wasn't good enough or that I know you can't do it, but I'll get it for you. Um, I probably wouldn't be the person I am now. And that's a very important fact to, to maintain, right? Because a lot of our students, as we know, because we're online and it's a disconnect, um, we know that they're feeling inadequate, they're feeling floundering, they're feeling all sorts of things. So the most important thing is to let them explore, you know, why they feel like this and how they can feel better about it. Because ultimately it's always gonna be up to us individually to make sure that we feel good enough and not for other people to tell us that we are, right? Now, that's one thing. I gotta admit, I wanted to be an AEL because I wanted to prove to myself I was good enough. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's always reasons, right? There's always things that we want. There's always things that we like. <laughs> but that's basically it. So, and my connection to Adobe goes way back, but, uh, um, you know, it, back to that magazine, because I wrote a lot of articles, uh, a lot of competitive analysis and things of that nature. Pretty good for the person who wasn't a writer. So that's about it. <laughs> I don't really have much more to tell you. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Diane. And that just really hit home. I think, um, you know, I'm seeing a lot of educators uh, post in the chat, um, especially that um, it's so important to have skills for creative communication. This hits home oh, yeah. so well. And I think we all have that at times, this, this imposter syndrome or feeling yep. like, you know, we're, we're not, um, you know, qualified for something. And really, it's just building that confidence and the fact that you can build that in your own students and mm -hmm. that you can tell your personal story and even show that vulnerability, I think is is so uh, powerful. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much for, for opening up um, and sharing that, that personal story with us uh, okay. today. And I'm sure it's, it's going how I got to... <laughs> yeah. 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 And I'm sure there's a lot of people who've, who've come along in in some things you know not maybe not the same but similar you know we all feel that way a lot of the times that it's not uh, I, and again I'm speaking on behalf of everybody but I don't think that's the truth right not everybody feels this way but it does come up um, and when you're trying to be the leader right you have to somehow show that you know we all have these struggles we all have these problems but you're equally as creative as anybody else out there right and that's the important part right? For them to, to understand that. Um, and also, if anybody wants to get in touch with me on collabs, anytime, <laughs> all my stuff is on the Spark page. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we'll we're going to post that in the chat. And I know you also shared your your handle there. So at yeah. um, Diane underscore early, if you have questions or you want to connect with Diane, um, thank you so much again for, for joining us today. Thank you. Wonderful. So I'm seeing um, some reactions to our first um, two panelists. So thank you both to Diane and to Susan for joining us today. 
And I see we have some a couple other folks joining in. We have uh, Rahul joining us from India. Nice to see you. And um, Leona, um, who, as you know, all from the Adobe for Education team, uh, how important it is for students to have skills for creative communication. So again, if you're just uh, tuning in, we are here with our Adobe for Education leaders on a creativity leadership panel, each sharing their unique perspectives on um, being a creative leader and what it means to be a leader in education. So up next, I'm um, very excited to introduce uh, Heather Lawrence. So Heather Lawrence is an Adobe education leader. She is the program director at J School Tech, and she is also the senior digital media trainer at the School of Journalism and Mass Communications for the University of Kansas. Today, Heather will invite you to think differently about carving out your own personal brand uh, for leadership and how to make an impact on your campus. She'll invite you to, quote, build your own systems to create uh, change. So Heather, I'm going to bring you on to tell us more about this idea. Um, welcome, Heather. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello. Well, I feel like this is, I love when we do these things and you start to see all the connections between what everyone talks about. And just in the community in general, you, you just have all these similarities with people. So I'm going to refer to this as subtitle part two of imposter syndrome and how to get over it. I love it. I'm just going to bring up your um, uh, presentation here, Building Your Own Systems for Change, and I'll have you take it away. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us and, and giving us some of your precious time to listen. And hopefully over these um, few minutes, you'll see some similarities between all of us and take some of this and use it for yourself. So when I talk about systems for change, I want to kind of start with some of those messages that we receive. Um, and part of this is the story of how I got here. So when I was a kid, like this photo would have been my perfect day of just like, I'm going out, I'm collecting rocks. Those rocks are now my pet rocks and we're going to create something. There's the Crayola crowns and there was no better day than new Crayola crown day, fresh marker day. I got new paints day. I loved making and creating as a kid. And in my home, that was not weird. Um, that was encouraged. And um, my parents gave me a lot of resources to help grow that. But as I got older, the systems that I, I was in did not encourage that. Um, I went to journalism school and I was, I never really felt like I fit in. I was too visual for the writers, but I wasn't one of the creatives either. I was in kind of this limbo. And when I became a high school teacher, you know, digital and graphic design and digital photography, you know, it, it wasn't as elite as traditional media. Um, and also, you know, in, in high schools, a lot of times, you know, art and creativity is treated as kind of the whipped cream or the cherry on top of the educational system. So it was, it was always this feeling of not quite fitting in, not quite being a part of things um, and thinking differently than people. And now in academia, there's still messages that I receive. So I've had messages that non-tenure track people don't belong in the room. I've had messages that said, well, you're not one of us. And so what I wanted to talk to you about is how you can work against the messages that you receive. So first of all, you do belong in the room. You belong as a creative human to be in that room. So there's a couple of things that I do to help just ingrain that into my head. I do a lot of personal work on that. Um, today, I journaled for 30 minutes on how I am enough. That was my theme for today. I'm um, kind of like Susan told us, I do a daily bit of creativity. I'm really into fresco right now and, and creating with that. Um, so that personal work. 
then at some point you just have to speak up. You have to speak your ideas into existence. And once I started doing that, once I started saying to myself, I belong in this room, I deserve to be heard. I don't care if they tell me that because I'm not tenure track, I don't deserve to be in the room. I don't care. And when I started doing that, I realized it wasn't the skills I have. It wasn't knowing Photoshop or XD or InDesign or whatever that made me unique. It was the way I think. It was the way I looked at things. It was my ideas that made me different. So once you can start, and this is constant work that I still do, to say I belong in the room, your next step is to find your people. You have to find your people. You can't go out there alone. So one of the great ways that I have done that is I'm part of a campus group at KU called the Adobe Power Users. So we get together, we create, we learn, we make. Those are my people. And we've continued that um, across different semesters. And it's just fellow creatives. I have reached out in different events across campus. And so I've started collaborating with different divisions. Um, I'm, I'm working on sharing those things with people and sharing within the AEL community. So wherever you find your people, whether it's locally or internationally, find those people. I think that finding your people helps give you the strength to start opening the doors for others. You know, I look at it as part of my privilege of being a child who was told that they may not belong, um, that it's my job to kick a door in for someone else. And it's my privilege to do so. So I always allow my students to experiment. I always allow them to be wrong. Again, some of the things that both Susan and Diane shared with us, allow them to be themselves, allow them to make mistakes. Look around in your community and find out other voices that can be amplified. You know, even though I recognize that I have a great deal of imposter syndrome, I'm still gonna kick open the door for other people. And the whole time I can still kick in the door and feel like I don't belong. I can still kick in the door and feel like my work isn't good enough, but it's my job to, to open those doors for other people. So I'll be real honest. I came to a lot of these realizations in the last few years and talking about it with some of my friends and colleagues. They said, do you know you say this thing? You always say, hey, I've got an idea. And people listen. And I'm like, "They really? Hey, I, people listen when I say I've got an idea. Yeah, they actually do. So here, here's some of my, hey, I got an idea. One of my ideas was let's make this spot where students can hang out, they can learn, they can create, they can make. So we got an, a donor, we built this space we called the J bar. Um, that's where we hang out, that's where we learn. Hey, I've got an idea. Let's have a creative jam. Let's do that with our other in-state university. Let's have alumni come back. Let's make a full day of it. Got an idea. We just did a, a reconstruction and I was part of the design team for it. And so I said, let's make our remodel like a tiny house. So everything you see in this picture, it never looks the same on any given day. We move the furniture around. I made sure that all of our furniture can be moved easily by anyone, no matter what. Our students who are in wheelchairs can move this furniture around. Our students who have uh, vision issues are allowed to move things around. We have just this tiny house that we can build in whatever way we want. As part of it, I said, I want these bright yellow chairs. Like the space needs some bright, and I went, bright yellow chair. No, trust me, the bright yellow chairs work. Everyone loves the bright yellow chairs. They want more bright yellow chairs. So one morning I get a phone call 
It's, it's my Dean. She's like, we have a donor. I need an idea. And this was where it all came full circle to me because someone who I admire, someone who um, is an amazing leader is calling and asking me for an idea. So, hey, I've got an idea. And my idea is we're going to retrofit, speaking of a tiny house, a little, little RV and take technology training on the road. Because there's a lot of places and spaces where there are young people like me who feel that they don't belong in their communities, who don't have access to resources and people. And I want to find them. I want to pack up my RV, find those people and start kicking in doors for them. So thank you so much for listening. I hope this has inspired you to find your next idea. Thank you so much, Heather, for sharing that with us. And I think it aligns so nicely with um, the previous uh, speakers um, from Susan Mango Curtis and, and Diane Ehrlich. I think just that's such a powerful position as a, a faculty member, as an educator, to be able to kick down doors for your students, to present them with those opportunities, to give them that confidence um, that they can be creative and they have so many opportunities to collaborate with one another. Um, so thank you so much for, for sharing that with us today. You are welcome. It looks like I've got several people ready to join me on my RV trip. So I'm excited about that. I'll just drive around the country and pick up other AELs and we'll go to areas where they need creativity and technology. Absolutely. I love that. And I know there are a couple of people watching on, on YouTube and Facebook. So if you're interested in definitely um, reach out to Heather. I see you've posted your, your handle in there, H.A. Lawrence. Um, be sure to connect. And thank you again for sharing your inspiration today. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you again to Heather. And if you have any questions or comments for any of our panelists, please post them in the chat. And again, we are here uh, live on Adobe Education Channels with um, a select member of Adobe Education Leaders sharing their um, creativity and leadership. And so up next, um, I am excited to be joined by Andy Phelps. Um, Andy is a professor at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand and a professor at the American University in Washington, DC. Andy is an Adobe education leader and also serves as president and founder of the Higher Education Video Game Alliance. So Andy's going to tell us how he recontextualizes his thinking to gamify um, his own leadership journey with Game On, how to lead and create new programs of study. So I'm going to bring on Andy. Uh, thank you again so much, Andy, for joining us today. I know it's late for you um, in New Zealand, so we really appreciate you taking the time to share with us. Uh, totally my pleasure. Happy to, happy to be here. Um, it is... It is, yeah, the time difference is a little rough. Uh, so hopefully this will be somewhat coherent. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, yeah, the, the subtitle to this talk is, is um, how to get told no enough that it doesn't matter anymore. Um, so this is me. Um, so I grew up in the generation that, that has always had video games. Um, the Atari came out right when I was, was a, a young kid. And a lot of time with games, loved games, uh, thought games were really cool. Never thought that I would be involved in making games or in teaching people how to make games. Um, and I started as a, as a faculty member in, in 99. And almost right away, my students came up to me and said, we heard you did some work in video games because uh, I'd freelanced with some stuff in, in, uh, in college. And, and they were like, we want to do that. This is what we want to do. This is what we're super excited about. And... Um, I'll, I'll leave this next slide up for a second because at the same time um, in the early 2000s, uh, it's, it's funny to look back on it now, but there was this drop in computer science enrollments and colleges were very concerned and there was lots of press about there's not going to be enough STEM graduates and, and you know big tech companies are going to have nobody to hire and we're going to lose our competitiveness and all this other kind of stuff uh, floating around. And... I was looking at that and I said, you know, um, maybe it's the way that we're talking about 
what computing is that's turning so many people off. Um, it's not just the job market. It's that, you know, students were coming to us and we were saying like, you know, have fun learning to program for a year and a half before you can actually make anything that you might care about. And that's a really, um, it's not a great educational proposition just right from the get go. And um, so what we did is I got together with a, a group of our faculty and, and we put together a proposal for doing games right from the beginning and making games programs to teach people how to make games. And along the way, they would learn other stuff about art and technology and making software and design and, and all of these things. Uh, and that probably went, went nowhere. Um, here's another you know, projected, oh, nobody's going to work in computing ever again slide. Um, and we made this curriculum and uh, we got told no and no and also no. And um, one of the really interesting bits about that was um, I sort of discovered that universities have this really weird definition of innovation, uh, which is can you point to another university that's already doing it, which seems like it would be the opposite of innovation and probably is uh, the thing that universities do all the time. Um, and so we eventually got this through and the way we got it through was to really harp on this problem about STEM education and about computing graduates and about all of this, this thing, right? And, and what that meant to me was that this is a problem that the university cared about, that administration cared about. And this was a problem that we really cared about um, in terms of educating our students and helping them do the, the things that they wanted to do. And we were able to find some alignment between those two things. And that's the way that ultimately that happened. And so we made a games program and I got to work with just absolutely incredible, incredible students that here are some, um, you know, that have gone on to make the products that have, have defined, um, defined games in, in, in the last, you know, decade or two. Um, I made really good friends with my university president because our program was very successful and got him to come and play our games. Uh, and then we partnered um, to work with the state of New York to make a research center around games and films and animation and interactive stuff called Magic. Uh, so I got to design and build a $30 million building on my campus. And um, that was really weird. And when I look, when I look back on that whole career, and, and then I moved to American and to New Zealand to try to do that same thing at, at ever greater scale. Um, DC because it's where where policy gets made, and and New Zealand because they have um, some some you know some real interest in in growing what they're doing in film in New Zealand into uh, games and interactives in a, in a much more profound way. And I had I look back on all of that now, and I think well. The reason that we were able to do this was partly because we had a lot of a lot of great people and a lot of great talent and some really good ideas around games and education and, and all of that stuff. But we were also able to do it because there was this, this wave coming through that had arguably nothing to do with what we were doing. It was this, this dot-com bubble had crashed. People were unsure about the future of, of what education was good for and what jobs people would have. And, and all this kind of stuff. And we were able to, to link those things. And what's, what's really interesting about that, right, is that we just saw probably the wave come through education in 100 years, right? This, this pivot that everybody had to go through with this stupid pandemic, right, is gonna mean that organizations and governments and and schools and, and education as an institution is gonna be looking for things and looking for solutions and looking for ideas in a way that, that it probably hasn't for a while. And now, like there's, there's, I know everybody's tired, I'm tired, like everyone's sick of, you know, you're online, you're offline, you're partly online, you're this, you're that, all of that kind of stuff. But there's a wave there and, and a mentor of mine described it to me as like, you can always try to do things whenever you try to do them, but sometimes you're not gonna go anywhere because you're not in sync with everything else that's happening. And to use a surfing analogy, you wait for the, for the wave 
and th and that's when that's when you do it. That's when you ride. And there's a wave in education right now. So somebody's going to do some really amazing things on the you know on the back of of all of this chaos. Um, and I hope that it's you, honestly, right? So now's a moment where people are going to have a lot of freedom to try new things. Um, and there's going to be resources that you can tap into, um, but figuring out how to do that effectively, um, you know, is is probably the next the next big thing. Um, so uh, that's my contact information. If you want to get in touch, um, if you want any of the curriculum that we made for games, if you want to see what the programs were, uh, if you want to look at what I'm doing now at, at American and at Canterbury and and all of that stuff, uh, it's all online. Um, so you can you can you know download it, use it, take it, whatever. Um, and uh, and thanks for having me. Oh. Great. Well, thank you. Andy, so much for, for joining us today and for sharing all of the great work that you're doing. Um, with It's incredible always to see what your students create um, and all of the curriculum that you have for game design. So timely, um, just riding the wave of the pandemic and seeing everything that is, is coming up uh, next and, and how we can all be innovative. Um, and thank you for sharing your contact info. I've also noticed that on your... Um, on the bottom, you've also shared your um, handle there. So if folks have more questions, they can um, get in touch. But yep. thank you, Andy, so much again for joining us, and especially uh, with the different time zones. So we really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you again to Andy Phelps and um, for sharing that with us. And again, we'll post that uh, Spark page in the chat so you can get access to that game design curriculum and resources as well. Um, and we have some more folks uh, joining in. Chris, it's great to see you. Uh, this is all very motivating. And um, we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts um, as well in the comments. If you're on Facebook or um, Twitter, again, if you're just joining in, um, this is our Adobe Education Leaders Creative Leadership Panel um, to um, kick off right before the academic year. So next we have um, another Adobe Education Leader joining us, uh, Chris Willey. And so Chris is a senior lecturer and director of the Immersive Media Lab and the area head for creative technologies at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee in the US. Chris suggests that if you already have you're a leader, now what? Um, so we'd love to hear from you, Chris. I'll go ahead and bring you on the live stream now um, to share your screen. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I just want to say before I get started, everything that's come out so far has been just incredibly inspirational. Um, the, the whole like act of making this uh, leadership panel has been so fun to get to know the other Adobe education leaders and just just to feel with them for a second what it is to be teaching in the middle of, uh, as Andy says, this, this stupid pivot. Um, but I think we're all finding new ways and we're all finding ways to, to, to ride them and share with, that, with other people. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, mine is less about like the specific background or the specific journey. It's more about this moment. Um, and it's a moment that I, I think we all should have. And it's the moment when you recognize this mantle of leadership. Um, I know exactly where I was when it happened. I'm, I'm an amateur gardener and I was listening to this audio book and this quote, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more and become more, you are a leader. And it arrested me. I remember stopping in the middle of the garden and realizing I've been teaching for about a decade and of course I'm a leader, obviously I'm a leader. If you teach, specifically if you teach creativity, you're a leader of some sort because everything that we do opens up our students to be able to do more and be more. And I think that's really important to just recognize 
that we have that mantle. Another part of this is I wanted to share some resources right here in the talk. So this is coming from Simon Sinek's lovely book called Leaders Eat Last, and I highly recommend it. So now what? You recognize that you have this mantle of leadership. What do you do with it? Um, what, one of the things, I don't know if I should say this, but as the other speakers are going, all of us are talking to each other and we all realize like, this is so inspiring. We're all trying to figure out what to do next. And I don't know as I have, you know, an answer that's definitive, but I have an answer that I think is important. And that is most of us are coming from an educational system that doesn't, that ne doesn't necessarily, uh, isn't conducive to what we need. We all have these abilities to be these individual things, but a lot of us are coming from a system that's kind of safe and stable and uh, banking and regurgitative. And there's just a lot of things there that I think we can change. Um, these are some pictures from my uh, garden over the last year. And, you know, the more that I think- Oh, and Chris- I, Yeah, please. Really quickly, do you want to um, share your screen one more time? I think we just uh, are reconnecting it. Oh, yeah, no problem. I hope that that wasn't uh, an issue. Yeah. I think I had... Uh... Cool. How's that? Is that better? Clara, is that better? Okay, you're adding it now, sorry, forgive me. Okay, so I'll just quickly go through those uh, slides real fast. This was the, uh, if your actions inspire others to uh, dream more, learn more, and do more, then you're a leader, coming from Simon Sinek's book. And then the now what business. And then these are the flowers that we were talking about before. Again, I apologize for for that. Um, but, you know, as I as I think about what I'm doing in the garden, and what I'm doing in the classroom, I started to purposely confuse those two efforts. Because the truth is, what I would rather do is be, a, be somebody who facilitates growth or facilitates learning. And this is that growth mindset that's coming in. Um, but it's not necessarily what or how I was taught. And I suspect how a lot of us were ta taught. So I came across this quote from Ursula Franklin, who's a physicist and educator. Um, and there's two different parts of the same quote. Uh, so yet all of us who, uh, who teach know that magic moment when teaching turns into learning depends on the human setting, the quality and the example. That's us, that's the leadership. But if there was ever a growth process, if there was ever a holistic process, a process that cannot be divided into rigid predetermined steps, it's education. And that second one, that one smacks as something that didn't quite jive. Because when I think back to my own education, it was a predetermined process. It was rigid. And it wasn't necessarily holistic. It was completely atomized. Like in this class, I'm learning this. And the questions are already on the test. And I have to make sure I memorize the answers to those questions and regurgitate them back. And look, I, I get that I'm sitting in a privileged space of teaching at the college level, but I find that there's got to be ways that we can bring more gray, more, more chance, more risk into our classrooms so that we can find new ways to grow together. One of the things that I have been focused on, by the way, this comes from the book, The Real World of Technology. Um, but one of the things that I've been focused on is how do I get away from a classroom that looks like this, this predetermined, perfectly manicured, everything is perfect, there is no chance, there's no anything that could go wrong, but to make it so that the students can grow the way that they need to grow. Um, and I had come across um, this model of flow state. I'm not even gonna try to pronounce uh, Mihaly's whole name and I probably messed up that, um, but flow has been around for a while. And one of the things that I find really important about leadership is how do we move our classrooms to be conducive of flow? And this is one of those questions that a lot of people are asking, and I'm hoping to bring this to you as a leader, 
which is, you know, how do we take this idea of growth and all these different trajectories and kind of combine them into a space? And so this, this idea of systems thinking is something that I play with quite a bit in my uh, teaching and learning practice. And it's a lot like gardening. I, if, I, if I get my garden ready at the beginning, then things are going to grow there right, right away and very nicely. So what I have my students do is I, I, I have them look at their passive pleasures, the things that they do, uh, that they really enjoy doing, and I give them permission to bring those things into the content of the course. The next thing that we do is we align those things with what we're actively exploring. And if possible, I'll try to get the students to take some other parts that they actively explore and pull those in too. So there's a little bit of kind of connecting of the dots that's happening here. And then lastly, those two things, when you bring their passive pleasures and their active explorations into the same space, then that's when time starts to go away and you get into that lovely flow state. I think as leaders, we need to try to find ways to add this to our classroom, regardless of the curriculum that we're teaching. How do we bring the students' engagement to the forefront and start where their energy is? So this is the, the kind of key for intrinsic motivation. And if you don't have motivation, if the students don't care, then what do you got? And I feel like if we're teaching creativity, we really should try to find ways to help the students see that what they care about is permissible as content to be entered into our classroom environment and to actively explore and dig deeper into. All of this is coming from this book called Good Business. So I'm going to finish with this. Why would we want to do this? Why would we want to change the way we've been teaching right along into something that's more conducive to what our students need? And I'll just level with you all. I really want my students to learn that they don't need me, that they can teach themselves, and that their communities that they're growing with are what they actually need. And the hope is that if I grow them, help them grow the right way, then eventually they're going to start nurturing me. And it becomes, in our classroom, kind of a two-way street. This is an illustration from the Creative Worry Lines. I very much enjoy what this person uh, continues to come up with. But I feel like this is such a great metaphor for teaching. We put the time in, we put the energy in. Before we know it, that time and energy is given right back to us. So all of this is coming from um, uh, Yuval Noah Harari's 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, which is basically saying, look, everything's changing so darn fast that why would we have the audacity to know what buttons and levers and software that we should teach our students? We need to give our students the ability to do those soft skills like communication and creativity and collaboration and critical thinking. Um, these are things that it doesn't matter what kind of buttons or levers are around, the students are going to be better for those experiences. So uh, if you're interested in this, I've got more stuff to talk about with the I Ideas Aggregator blog that I'm starting. Um, I'll uh, post a link to that here in the chat, or I'll have that get posted. And then here's all my contact information. I've got so much more to share with you all, but I really do appreciate this time. Thank you again. Thank you again, Chris, so much for joining us and, and sharing this. Um, I, I love that metaphor of the watering can and then you know receiving that back as an educator. And I see, I'm seeing comments in the chat here. And Diane says, I totally agree. I try for a flow in the classroom. It makes a three hour class feel like no, no time has passed at all, um, especially with full engagement. Um, so thank you again so much for, for sharing this with us and uh, for sharing your social handles and other contact info. Again, if you are tuning in uh, from our channels, be sure to connect with Chris. Um, really looking forward to seeing how you can collaborate with our community of educators. Thank you. Right. So if you, again, if you're just uh, tuning in, we are here with our Adobe education leaders um, for our creative leadership panel, uh, marking the end of the summer, midsummer, kicking it off for back to school, um, hearing about different insights in creative approaches to leadership. Um, so a lot of great um, inspiration here so far today. And I'm excited to introduce our next speaker, um, Mark Voschalski is an Adobe education leader, and he is head teacher of photography at TAFE New South Wales Ultimal Campus 
joining us all the way from Australia. And so today, Mark will help us explore the idea of born leaders or made leaders, yourself and your students achieve leadership regardless of where you begin in that description. So thank you, Mark, again, so much for joining us. And again, with time zones, uh, we really appreciate it. And Mark, I'm bringing you on now, looking forward to uh, hearing from your perspective. Oh, thanks so much, Clara. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm going to start my presentation because I know we're on the clock. Great. Um, look, it's a real honour to be well, here. Mark, uh, I will have you take it away. Thank you. Um, thanks, guys. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, it's it's 4 a.m. here in Australia, so um, I'm getting an early start, or I'm getting I'm even having an early start or a very late night. I'm not quite sure yet, but um, I've I have changed added a word to the to the title for this talk and to basically ask the question, are great leaders born, made or discovered? So currently <clears throat> the leadership role that I'm in is a head teacher of uh, photography at Ultimo TAFE. Uh, it's a really great role. Um, uh, interestingly enough, though, I'm the least qualified photographer in the section. Uh, so coming into a new role last uh, October, I had to ask myself, well, you know, do I belong in the room? <laughs> so that was great to hear that talk earlier. Do I belong in the room? Because I'm not. But once I realised I had things to bring to the table that maybe the rest of the team didn't, um, I settled in quite quickly. But it's a great team. Um, they all they um, they inspire me and they make me laugh uh, all the time. Uh, they're very passionate educators and uh, and they're awesome educators. So. You know, right now uh, I'm just very lucky that uh, I'm surrounded, you know, just by beautiful humans. But leadership isn't always uh, a walk in the park. You know, sometimes it can be, it can challenge you. So for this for this talk, I wanted to, you know, address the question: or Are great leaders made, born, or or discovered? So. If you're someone who has maybe thinking about a leadership role or maybe you're seeing that potential in your students, uh, hopefully what I've got to say will, will resonate with you and you can apply it to your education environment or just to your life in general. So some leaders that have inspired me, I think it's important to understand, you know, what sort of leader you want to be or what kind of leaders your, your students might want to be and you sort of help them uh, discover those answers. Um, so one of my favourites uh, early on in my life, um, my first uh, inspiration as a leader was this guy. All right, so if anyone from Disney is watching, just take it easy, all right? I'm using the image for education purposes, please. No lawsuits, all right? Um, but I love Yoda because, you know, he's awesome with a lightsaber, but he's wise and he believes in something. And... Uh, a great leader has to believe in something, I think. And um, what, does, what does he believe? Well, he believes in the force. And he does really cool stuff and says really cool stuff like this, do or do not. There is no try. So, again, all right, educational purposes, please don't come down on me. Uh, this is another one of my favourite leaders. Uh, this is a – does anyone know who this is? I'd love to see an answer in the chat there. Uh, there's a little bit of a delay, but um, – this is uh, one of my favourite artists, and this is Arnie DeFranco. She's from Buffalo, New York, and just an amazing singer-songwriter. She's uh, written, uh, recorded 20 albums on her own label called Righteous Babe. Her, her label is called Righteous Babe. She's just a huge inspiration to me, and uh, that's Arnie DeFranco. And she stands for something. She's very political. She's very uh, outspoken, and she writes beautiful, and she's talented, and she's... Uh, Brave. And uh, another one, uh, someone else that I really look up to uh, and have done in the past is this guy. So if you're not aware, this is uh, Francis Ford Coppola. And uh, as a leader, I find him inspiring because he's, he's able to do complex things and he's, he's adaptable and uh, he's a real problem solver. So to me, they're great leaders. Uh, but so are great leaders, are they born? Well, I think we can all relate to this person, you know, it, it could be you. I, I think in my case, um, I'm not saying I'm a great leader, but it, I think I was born with some leadership abilities, I always found myself being pushed forward into a leadership position, uh, gravitate towards those, and you and you probably know someone in your life 
uh, that, that fits that description. So, or are they made? Well, if they're made, you know, they attend a lot of courses and people that read a lot of books, attend seminars and, you know, those kind of events where they're learning about leadership. Or are they discovered? So discovering a leader or your own leadership qualities can happen any time. Um, I've been an outdoor education leader with youth at risk clients and um, it's it, one of my favourite things was to take them in the bush, get them lost, give them a map and uh, show them how to use a compass and see what happens. And on many occasions it would be the kid that's quiet at school uh, that would step up and actually into a leadership position because they had the answer of how to get out of that spot, how to find their way out, while the loud guys at school would go quiet because they would actually go anxious. They were out of their comfort zone. So discovering a leader is really interesting and exciting to see if you're a part of that. But are they are great leaders born, discovered or made? Well, not quite. I think that potentially great leaders are uh, born, made or discovered. Born, made or discovered makes it sound like it's done, it's finished. But uh, great leaders all share an interest in leading. But they take that further and they want to keep learning. And that's the part that, is a, you know, a great leader is always growing. And so they keep on looking around so they can be the best person that they can be and the best leader they can be. And... Um, if you if you relate to that and, um, you know, what makes someone great is debatable, I suppose, but I, I guess the thing I want to get across is that it's it, it, the journey never ends. Um, your potential, you may have been born with it or maybe you developed that because you kept, you know, you've, you attended a course, a leadership course, and you thought, this is great. I, I actually i am interested in this now. Or maybe uh, someone discovered that you have leadership potential. But... If you want to become a great leader, you've got to keep changing, you've got to keep growing. But fear stops us, right? Why don't people take up opportunities to, into leadership positions? Not everyone has to be a leader, but if you've got the potential or you think you do or someone's told you that you do, why don't you? If you're interested in it, why don't you? And sometimes it's, we just get scared. So let me tell you about this picture that you've already seen. Uh, this the story of this photo right here. So this is a photo of Arnie DeFranco at uh, the State Theatre in New South Wales in, in Sydney, and I took this picture. Uh, the venue that I that I attended was a seated venue, quite a conservative uh, space. So and I was sitting towards the back of the main floor, and I decided she was up there by herself without the band at this point, just singing. So I walked straight down the middle. A little bit scared because I just wanted to get a good photo of her. Uh, and I walked right down right down to the front, looked up at her, held up my camera, and she uh, gave me a little nod. So I took this picture. And then what was interesting is after the photo, I had a choice. What do I do? Well, do I walk back? I'm not going to walk back. I'm standing in front of my hero here, so I'm going to start to dance. I was the only person with, with thousands of people in the audience standing in front of her dancing. And sure enough, because I didn't care, um, you know, people started to run down and join in. So that was really exciting to connect with a, a, an inspiration of mine. And so, so what's, the, what's the worst scenario if you take a chance? Will you survive it? Of course you will. More importantly, will you regret it if you don't have a go? So the fear of regret is a great motivator. And I think if you have any leadership potential yourself, just go for it. If you see that in your students, Try and connect them to whatever they need to, you know, whether it's even, even if it's finding out what kind of leader they want to be uh, and get them going on their way. And it's a fun journey. So great leaders are constantly growing. What does your great leader look like? Start sketching, guys, and find out. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, that's all I have. And uh, this is a little weird outtake uh, along with my email uh, if you're interested in ever getting in touch down here in Australia. Thank you very much. Perfect. Well, thank you, Mark. So that you shared as well. And again, be sure to follow um, Mark, who shared his email address there. And um, I know it was really late for you, so we really appreciate you uh, joining us today.
Uh, it was my pleasure. Uh, thanks for having me, and um, it's exciting to, to talk to people all around the world. And it's so great to hear such international perspectives, so thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you again um, to all of our panelists and for those who joined the Adobe Education Leadership Panel. Um, I hope you've enjoyed hearing from all of our Adobe Education leaders today. And we explored leading through creativity and through creative storytelling with Susan Mingo Curtis, remembering more capable creative leaders with Diane, building our own leadership network with Heather, getting it done and making it fun with Andy, and leading our students to realize their full creative potential with Chris, and last but not least, helping us to all achieve our best versions of ourselves with Mark. So thank you again to all educators for joining us today to explore this very valuable topic of leadership, positivity, and leading through our creativity. So we hope you enjoyed this panel discussion uh, with insights in, from our Adobe Education Leaders in Leadership and Education Through Creativity. And you'll be able to discover um, a lot more uh, talks from our educator community programs um, with the summit that we just wrapped up. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up the link here. Um, but if you uh, didn't get a chance to check out uh, the uh, summit last week, you can go to adobe.ly slash edu summit GA to catch all the recordings um, of all the uh, different panels last week and workshops. So thank you again so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you next week uh, with our regular programming as part of the Adobe Creative Educator Show. Thank you everyone for your inspiration um, and for joining us. And we look forward to a great uh, new school year. Thank you.